started the recording and it's ah, there it is it's now started you can just start the session i was saying i see there are a number of uh, members from your team who are joining maybe you can just introduce them as we go okay well guys uh it's a pleasure to be here and to share a little bit of my knowledge about the subject with you uh I extended the invitation for this uh, session to some people in Konomi. And uh, we see here Mariana and Roberto, also Ian just joined. Uh, well, they, they are all engineers here at Konomi and they were curious about the topic. So I opened the, the session for them, but the session is focused on your questions. Uh, I don't know if you already have them or if you would like me to do a brief, uh, I don't know, introduction to the subject or the challenge. It's up to you. I think we can start with a brief introduction as they prepare the questions. We had asked them to prepare the questions earlier, but we can just go ahead and do a brief uh, introduction. Then we can give the trainees a chance to ask more questions. Okay, guys. Uh, well, uh, the subject of uh, causality is one that interests me uh, the most because everything or most of the things we do using statistics or machine learning are related to correlations, not uh, causal factors. So, uh, but at the same time, the questions uh, business people like to to ask are related to are related to causes. So, as you saw in the challenge, one example of this is uh, questions that are interested in things that did not happen yet, or are not reflected in data. For instance, uh, what will happen if I increase uh, the price of a product or decrease the price of a product? Will it sell more or will it sell less? We don't know uh, just by looking at the data because the data is uh, our footsteps or some, uh, it's a recording of what happened, but we're talking about something that has had not happened yet. So, it's different from, you know, when you, tra when you train a model to you know, predict something, a phenomenon that doesn't change and you have already showed uh, or recorded in data a very, a, a broad spectrum of this phenomenon. So if you're, we're talking about, oh, let me train a model that predicts the, the ballistic results of uh, a shooting. So you measure the angle of uh, the ball that you're throwing, you measure the force, and you try to predict the distance. The laws of physics will not change. And as soon as, uh, if you have enough data about the angles and about the force, your model is going to be uh, okay. But uh, in most cases that are uh, interesting to machine learning or modern, uh, science, we're interested in things that are more complex than that and the data we have is not enough to uh, to answer. So a few, a couple of years ago the, this, this topic started to gather more attention and more research was made on it and uh, Judea Pearl is uh, one of the names that I am very interested in following and they and he developed it along with his team a very robust framework to uh, describe the problem and to tackle the problem so it, it revolves around uh, an object a mathematical object called a causal graph which is like a normal graph, but it has some limitations. It cannot be, uh, it cannot have loops. 
So it must be an acyclic graph and you have to know it beforehand. Once you have it, uh, using the data and some other techniques, you can answer some of the questions that I, I gave as an example in the beginning of the talk. So, uh, more recently, I became aware of a, a very good paper which I included in, in your material, which makes, uh, which summarizes the state of the, of the field. So, you can see that there are people uh, trying to merge causality with machine learning. You can uh, familiarize with the terminology and the techniques. It's a, it's a long paper, but it's a good one to you know for you to get up to speed in this topic. So about the challenge itself, uh, it's an introductory challenge. And I think the document, uh, explains it very well, gives a lot of examples and uh, paths for you to to move forward. But that's it. Uh, I think my introduction ends here and now it's time for you to, to make questions. One at a time, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Mauricio. Uh, before we wait for the trainees, uh, you can just go ahead and raise your hand or type your questions uh, on, the, um, on the messages. Maybe I have one question just to start off the session. And uh, I was wondering, because uh, we keep saying that we are yet to actually do machine learning for causal type of problems, and uh, one, of the one of the things they're doing at the end of uh, task two is actually to train a model with the, with the variables chosen by the causal graph and uh, without just to compare what is going on. So when we say machine learning and causal inference, what we're seeing is trying to be done. It has not yet been done. What are we looking at? Uh, like I'm trying to understand when we are doing a causal inference issue with machine learning, how does that look like if it's not what we are doing this week? Okay, uh, well, it's a question that I did not have a definite answer yet because, uh, you know, the, the field is developing and we had so we had made some experiments with it uh, inside Konomi and we have already uh, submitted and it's going to be published soon in IG, IJCNN uh, conference, which uses uh, caus causally related techniques to create a score. So what we did in this, in this specific case was uh, we were trying to create a model to predict uh, the voting pattern of uh, some politicians inside Brazil. And uh, one of the features that we included was generated by uh, this technique. So this technique takes uh, the past votes of each and every uh, politician in, the, in a specific, um, uh, around a specific topic and it tries to uh, create a graph that say that tells us uh, which politician has influence over the other. So it generates a score for this edge, and this score is used as a, a feature for the a machine learning uh, algorithm. So uh, the results were very promising. Uh, as after we trained the model, we trained the uh, like GBM model in the, in the regular fashion. And after that, we run the, the SHAP values for this uh, model. And the features that were generated using this technique were uh, almost always among the top 10 uh, features. That So it shows that uh, this kind of information has predictive po power, so which is a very good indication that we are, uh, approaching something related to the cause. Uh, but 
I don't know if I answered your question uh, completely, Anastasia. I hope it, it helped. But uh, yeah. it uh, did help. Maybe just uh, to maybe let me see if I'm getting this clear. So instead of doing the causal graph with the statistical approach like Judea Pulse, so when we say using machine learning, this is what we are trying to do create the same causal graph but using machine learning. That's the idea. No, uh, in fact, uh, the, the technique that uses, uh, that generates the score, the causal score that I was talking to you about, uh, uses uh, some tests that Judea Pearl proposes. So what Judea Pearl says is, okay, you know a, a causal graph and you can validate a causal graph using data. So there are a kind of a couple of tests that you can do and the data can uh, refute or uh, not uh, a specific edge of the graph. So what we made is we assume a fully connected graph between the variables and use the data to uh, try to refute the, the edges. So uh, we are using this technique in order to create a graph that the data cannot refute, but it's uh, we are not uh, we have no guarantee that is the true causal graph. But it can, uh, what we assumed is that, well, it may not be the, the true, the definite causal graph, but it may still be useful. So we are going to use this information as a, a new feature for a, a machine learning model. So that's, that's what we made. Okay, thank you. I think that answers most of my question. <laughs> I can go to, I think Martin is raising his hand. So yes. we can... Uh, all right. Uh, I think, <clears throat> thank you. I hope that uh, you can be able to hear me. Uh, so I had 59 questions. Uh, okay, I'm just joking, but I just had two questions. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank so, you, Martin. <laughs> 59 uh, take a, a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the first question was, uh, how does this causal inference adjust to changes uh, in the models? So like when you keep on changing the models, how will the causal inference adjust to that? Then the second question is, is it really good uh, practice to keep on uh, adding causality to each and every type of model that you're creating? Okay, I'll start by the, the second one. Uh, at this point, uh, I'm not sure because I have no mathematical proof of the, the things that we're doing. But, uh, you know, when you're trying to solve a problem, uh, you have a, a bunch of tools. It's like a, a, your, it's like in your house, you have uh, knives, you have forks, you have hammers. You're, you don't, there is no definite answer. Oh, you must use a hammer every time you have to to check and see if it fits the problem it, if, if it's uh, the time you have in hand and the data you have in hand so uh, i think the first question is well it's another tool in your tool set it, i don't know beforehand if it's going to be useful for all the problems problems you're going to face in your professional life but uh, my personal bias is that you should try it because uh, what's the problem with a model that is uh, based only on correlations? You have no uh, you have no way to assure for the people that are going to use the model that this model is going to perform well in the future because it may have learned something from. Uh, uh, a correlation that is not truly related to the problem. So, uh, for instance, imagine that uh, you have uh, a shop that sells ice cream and you see that when the days are hot, you sell more ice cream. Uh, so, and you use it in your data. Oh, I'm going to relate the temperature of the day uh, with the uh, with the selling, or I it's very hot inside my shop, and I also turn on an air conditioner 
uh, when the days are hot. So my my energy bill is high when I sell uh, more uh, ice cream. So suppose I'm using the energy bill as a feature, and I can I create train a model and it, and it works fine because most of the time I'm in a shop and I it's a it's a hot day. I turn on the the air conditioning and it consumes a lot of energy. But uh, then I'm going to look at the model and look at the shape of the model and I'm going to say, oh, okay, using uh, a, lo a lot of energy will increase my, my sales. So I'll just keep the air conditioning turned on all the year and it's going to improve my sales. So this will not happen in the real world. So uh, that's, that's one example of the spurious correlation that I was talking about. And most of the problem that we face are not as straightforward as this one. So we're never sure when you're looking at purely at data, observational data, that we are not sure if this is causally related or not to the problem. And we cannot guarantee that that model will keep performing well because one or more of these variables may be uh, a confounding variable or something that will introduce more noise uh, into our model. And that's one of the reasons that uh, I see a lot of machine learning models uh, decaying very fast, probably because or they're overfitted or the, the, the data that is available is not uh, causally related enough to ensure a, a larger lifespan of the model. So, for the second question, my answer is uh, you're never sure, but you should try. Uh, and after this long answer, <laughs> I would kindly ask you to uh, repeat the question one, Martin. Uh, I've posted it in the chat, uh, the order of the questions that I had. Okay. Well, uh, causal inference is uh, once you have a causal model trained or adjusted, you can start to make predictions. So it's, uh, it's a different way to make predictions. You can make, today you can make a prediction using a, a machine learning model. It's going to fit on the data and it's going to answer your uh, future questions, or you can make a causal model, which is a different way to create a model, which tries to uh, be more robust in the sense that you're only going to use uh, causally related uh, information to make your predictions. But uh, this is not always easy to do because we don't know all the the graphs that describe the causality of some phenomenon. For instance, uh, draw me uh, the causal graph for uh, sales of a product. We don't know. We know maybe related to the price. It may be related to the the utility of the product. It may be related to the uh, other products that are in the market, it may be related to a lot of stuff. And we don't know beforehand what are all the factors that are going to have an impact on the sales of this product. And there are always uh, unobservable, unobserved uh, variables. For instance, uh, your product may be affected by a law that the government will make. Uh, your product may be affected by, I don't know, uh, the weather or the season. Uh, so it's, uh, and when you ask, how does causal inference adjust to changes? My answer would be, uh, if the phenomenon have changed, doesn't matter the model you made, you're going to update the model. So. If, uh, suppose you're uh, still doing a model that tries to predict 
the sales of uh, a product. You can do it using machine learning, you can do it using causal techniques. Uh, if, uh, as, as I said before, uh, a law changed or the climate changed, you might have to retrain your model or re, uh, recreate your model in some fashion. So if the, the underlying phenomenon changes, doesn't matter how you made the model, you're going to, you're going to have to make a, a new model. And uh, the difference between causal and non-causal models is that, is that in my point of, uh, under my, under the way I see it, is that as close, uh, as you approach the cause of something, uh, it tends to be more long lasting. And so if you, if you look at, imagine two points, you have a 100% co causal, 100% uh, non-causal. The non-causal is more brittle uh, when you look into the future because it, is, uh, it uses as information something that is not truly related to the cause of the thing that we're trying to predict. I don't know if I answered. So, you tell me, Martin. Yeah, uh, I've been able to understand uh, just uh, to some extent, but I had a follow-up question on that. Uh, so, it's good that, yes, uh, the way the causal model uh, just generally works, at least when there's the change on the law, at least there's also the model, you can be able to retrain it and change it. So currently you're saying in the market, uh, the causal models, there is some people who have sat down and have been able to like uh, create some, uh, besides the theoretical framework, now the framework like that can be used with, in programming or it's if, if it if it if it has already been implemented then this particular aspect of getting your model to uh, automatically adjust to the changes uh, can it also be incorporated to that those particular models i'm not sure i i completely understood the question but um i'll try to to say what I understood and you say if I understood it correctly. So you're trying to understand uh, what has been already implemented in terms of uh, frameworks or techniques that we can uh, exper experiment in, in real life project problems. And also uh, when we see a change in the phenomenon, how can we uh, automatically uh, initiate a retraining or something like that. Is it uh, what you're interested in, Martin? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so about the frameworks, uh, I think the document has some uh, examples of uh, libraries. I don't think the list is extensive, is is complete, but at, uh, because there are different groups trying to uh, develop the field in, in different ways. So, uh, Judea Pearl, for instance, uses uh, Bayesian networks and Bayesian networks have their, uh, they're good and they're bad. And also the other techniques have something that's good, something that's bad. So uh, the field is not uh, consolidated yet. We're not sure about the right way to do it. And there are a lot of people trying to uh, see what works and what does not work. And something that works in a, in a specific scenario does not work in a different scenario. So we're still trying to, uh, we're still, it's still in the, in the scientific, uh, moment we're not it's not uh it's different from uh a law in physics which is already being tested for i don't know 20 30 100 years and it works uh, given some very well-defined restrictions 
uh, it's different. Causality is uh, much newer, so we're not sure about uh, most about. We we are sure about very very small number of things. So the second part of the question relates to the uh, how we can automatically uh, check or start uh, retraining. It, this this part is very similar to the machine learning part. So this is uh, this is a good practice. Once you have a model and you have an expected performance for this model, uh, you can set up a monitoring procedure or a monitoring system, uh, which is going to you know keep track of the new predictions and always compare the performance of the predictions with uh, the expected performance. And if your model is not uh, enough, you say, well, you say, well, uh, this model is not working anymore. It's time to retrain. When you're talking about machine learning, it's uh, it can be automated. It is very easy, to, very easily automated. But we're not sure if the new model is going to have a performance as as good as the first one, or as good as, as is acceptable from a business perspective. So you're probably going to uh, automate the retraining, but you're going to have someone to uh, to see if the model uh, is to you know to approve the usage of the new model. If it's uh, Suppose you, your model retraining goes well, it's okay, you can automate it. But if your model does not go well, you have to, to talk to a data scientist or to someone that is responsible for this model and see, well, model is not working anymore, what can we do? Oh, we're going to go back to the data or look at the phenomenon, see what changes. So there's there is a part that is automatable, there is a part that is not automatable. And, well, that's it. Go on, begin. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry if you already answered this question, my network was uh, coming and going, so, Basically, uh, if I understood you correctly, you're saying that uh, the causal model is different from the normal modeling uh, or uh, what we've been used to so far is that uh, uh, during the causal modeling, we'll have a way of identifying uh, core or uh, root uh, causal variables for the variable we're trying to predict. So generally, later on our model, we have a better uh, uh, performance as well as resistance to change uh, if i if i understood you correctly is that it i'm just trying to confirm yeah yeah uh, you understood it correctly Binyan, but there's a catch in the in the causal models or at least in the causal techniques that are available today so again for instance the the technique that uh, the Pearl group proposes is based on the causal graph and this is not something that uh, the data tells us. This it is something that we have to write beforehand. So we say, oh, okay, I understand this phenomenon. I know how it works, and I can draw uh, some some dots and some lines that represent my understanding of this phenomenon. And afterwards. I'm going to use the data to uh, check if my proposed graph is correct or not, and also to uh, calculate the weights of each and every arrow in the graph. So a, a causal uh, model in the end is, a, is the causal graph that you propose it, but you use the data to uh, adjust the weights of the, the arrows in the graph in order to calculate an outcome. So it's a different uh, approach to modeling. Okay, so uh, we'll be selecting the variables beforehand manually 
before fitting the data to it. What does that make erroneous or uh, is this uh, initial selection done by a professional or something? Does that require some prior understanding of the phenomena before uh, trying to select the variables? And uh, if we made a mistake, how would we know? Uh, would the data later on tell us? Would, uh, that means would it fail to fit the proposed graph? Yeah, there are two ways for you to to identify an error. The first one is that there are some techniques uh, that uh, also do their pearls group proposed that allows you to use the data to refute uh, a specific error in your graph. So this is one way to check if if your proposed model is correct. The second um, way to know which there is something that is not working fine is that the predictions are going to be bad so the performance is going to be low uh, that's it okay thank you mauricio i'm sorry if i mispronounced mispronounce your name no no problem no. Vinya. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure I'm pretty uh, sure I'm going to pronounce more of your names wrong, so, so we're, 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 we're fine. We're fine. <laughs> Thank you. Go on, Titus. Yeah, okay. Um, good afternoon. Are you able to, to hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for the, for your time, uh, Mauricio, and uh, for the introduction and the answer sessions. So, um, personally, um, I'm really getting, I haven't really wrapped my hand around uh, <clears throat> the, the concept of the causal relationships. Um, like, I find it difficult to maybe differentiate with the usual machine learning modeling techniques because um. For our case, for instance, uh, the example that you're giving in our document, like the question of what will happen if I have the price of my product, like uh, from the machine model modeling perspective, maybe you could you could label that as an independent variable. I don't know, like how is it different from machine learning? Really, I can't really wrap my hand about, about uh, around that because yeah, I really can't. Yeah, I, I can't wrap my hand around that. Yeah, as of now. Yeah, so maybe you could just give a preview or maybe just a general understanding for a person who maybe has just started like this, uh, going through this a minute ago. Yeah, so yeah, thank you. That's a very good question, Titus. Uh, well, the, there are some concepts that are important here to answer your question. The first one is that uh, we have two at least two kinds of data the first one is observational data which is data that we gathered only by looking at the state of things this is observational data the second type of data that we can have is interventional data so we made an intervention and we know what happens after the intervention so uh, what what uh, uh, I'm trying to to say uh, when I, I'm bringing our attention to the causality is that what if questions they depend on interventional data? If we have interventional data, we can use machine learning techniques in order to uh, create models of it. But if we have only observational data, which is most of the cases. Uh, we cannot answer what if questions. So that's because uh, you look at the world or to a part of the world and you does not uh, interact with it. You see what happened. So your model is going to be answered questions about the world uh, where no interactions were made. And if your question is about what will happen if I do a specific interaction or a treatment in the using the term the correct terminology? Uh, we're not going to to be able to answer. So let me give you a, a, another example. Um, 
suppose you have a headache and we we have data about people that have headaches and you know I, I don't know I know your age I know your size I know uh, the time of the year and I know if your headache uh, persisted or not after a day for instance this is only uh, observational data now suppose that I also have in this data set uh, a field that tells me if you took or not uh, a headache uh, remedy so uh, we can split the data in people that took the remedy people that does not took the remedy and we can compare the the outcomes and try to see to what degree taking the medicine was useful for them or not so the medicine in this example is analogous to a not different kinds of interactions or interventions in different problems so in the problem of the price the intervention was to change the price of a product so in order to understand uh, the value or the cost of this change we have to compare uh, two different worlds one world in which we did the intervention another world in which we did not make the intervention so it is uh, uh, usually made by doing an A-B testing or a randomized trial. So this is the best way in order to, to evaluate the effect of uh, a, a specific intervention. But uh, it is not always possible to do that in real life. Uh, and that's why uh, scientific community spends so many times so many years you know like 20 years discussing if uh smoking was related or not to uh cancer to to pulmonary cancer and because you could not you know took a country or a city and to uh some coins if if the coin lands had you're going to smoke for the next 10 years if the coin lands uh, uh, the other side you're not going to smoke for the the next 10 years this is not ethical this is not feasible this is not uh, possible to do so the key concept here is that observational data is not enough to answer uh, what if questions it's did it help it Titus? oh yeah 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 uh, so from uh yeah i think uh, i've managed to get something out of that um so basically it's just applying the statistical uh reference into trying to understand what will happen if a variable changes or maybe a feature changes in our data it's trying to maybe just apply the statistical aspect of yeah they are just applying statistics yeah Oh, oh, exactly. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Who else? Okay. Maybe I can uh, ask uh, something just from what I have had. So I'm trying to understand what a successful project would look, would look like for the trainees this week. And uh, we're trying to say that um, what we expect to see is that there's a change in the performance, definitely a better performance when you do the modeling without uh, maybe doing this specific causal inference. And then after, after performing this inference, your yeah, model should actually perform better. So is that the kind of... Uh, maybe what everyone should be aiming at so that my model performs better when I do this, this inference? Well, uh, I cannot guarantee that, Anastasia, because it, it has something to do with the data that you have at hand. So, uh, what I believe, and I still have not uh, 
definite proof about it is that as you move closer to the cause, your uh, the, the variance of your error is supposed to reduce. I'm not talking about the performance itself. I'm talking about the variance of the error. So suppose you're doing a, a k-fold uh, model validation. So you split your data in five or in a different number, and you train train it using four and tests on on the remaining one, and you do it uh, in a in a way that you're changing the four that you're using and the one that you're testing. This is going to give you a variance of the error in your model. So uh, when you're choosing the, the features or the inputs and they are more closely related to the cause, even using machine learning techniques, you're expected to see a, variant, a, a, a smaller variance in the error so that's what i was uh, that's what i would like to to check to see if it's true or not so in order to do that you have to know beforehand which of the 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 features are truly related to the cause so your data set should be one that uh, is well understood by the science or the experts. So there's someone, some authority that's going to say, well, you should use this, this, and this. And when you use uh, more than these, or you use different uh, variables, your mo your, the error of your model is going to, to be more, uh, to be more noisy after the train. Did I make okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that answered my question. So, do we have any more questions from the trainees? Are we ready to do the the challenge this week? Okay. So, if while you you think about uh, any more questions if any, uh, I would like to say that uh, from my point of view, what is important here is that you start thinking about these questions. Because as I said, the field is not uh, mature enough in order for you to learn the best technique and to, to create the perfect model. But you must know that uh, machine learning or statistics alone are not enough to answer some kinds of questions. So you should uh, be aware of that in order not to delude yourself in the machine learning learning process. So that's going to be the first, the, the greatest, uh, you know, the most important lesson in under my, in my point of view. Okay. Okay. Thank you for thank you for that thought. <laughs> okay. So, any other question from the trainees? Time is almost over, but we still have a few minutes. Can take any other question. Okay. Without questions, I'll ask just someone from the trainees to give a thing. Uh, has that is time to be with us today. So maybe just one person from the trainers to give a thank you note, then maybe we can end it there. <laughs> Martin, Martin, ah, oh, nice. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you for that. Uh, that was very simultaneous uh, at Anastasia. But um, yeah, we want to thank you for the opportunity that uh, you've created time to come and uh, guide us through uh, not only just uh, the assignment, but also just uh, understanding the basic concepts of causality. That's very nice. And uh, we are looking forward to even more 
uh, talks together with you guys uh, so that you can be able to have uh, even more, even now maybe live coding sessions probably uh, so that you can be able to uh, understand it even much more deeper. So uh, thank you for the Kunami team, uh, everybody from Kunami team. Uh, also thank you for the for the organizers that's at Anastasia, Ten, Ten Academy, the entire team. And also uh, thank you to the all the trainees who have found time to come and uh, listen to the the concepts that are behind causality. It's, a, it's an emerging field and it's something that uh, we need to quickly get our heads around it so that we can uh, begin offering solutions where it's necessary. Yeah, so thank you and uh, that's all. Thank you all guys, especially for the ones that asked questions, but thank you for everyone that came here. Thank you for uh, also Mariana, Roberto, Julia, and all the economy in the end, and all, you know, everyone that is here. Thank you guys, it's always a pleasure to, to be with you. Okay, thank you, Mauricio. And maybe we should tell Martin that it is Konomi and not Konami, which is just a no problem. Mistake. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think we can end it there. Thank you for your time and uh, for the trainees uh, for attending. Uh, yeah, thank you. Have a good uh, day. I know it's still morning, people here are still on the evening and afternoon. So, just great day to, to Mauricio and our Konomi team. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Bye, Roberto.